We, in the tradition of playing, you know, crazy after lunch, we've got a double presenter thing going on. Yeah, never know. So we've got um, Tim, not Ted, Nugent. And we've got Paris Butfield Addison. And something, uh, so we had them each tell me something interesting about the other. Um, and so apparently Paris has a hundred copies of the shirt he's wearing right now. And Tim is a pyromaniac. So, yay. Thank you. Uh, all these things are sadly very true. It's okay, I didn't bring anything flammable because, you know, airport security. But apparently if you etch TSA approved on anything, you can take it through. Anyway, um, let's get okay, cracking. Moving on. Hi, we're here to talk about uh, interactive code-based documentation environments. Uh, uh, hi, I'm Tim, I'm the unicorn. I'm Paris, I'm not the unicorn in this picture. Uh, you can find us on Twitter and tweet at us while we're speaking if you'd like. We often like to reply because there's two of us, it means one of us can reply. It's actually a lot of fun. We recommend trying it in group presentations. Uh, we speak Australian. Uh, that means um, it's sort of like English, it's a little bit different, it's got more English in it than American. Um, so please tell us if we say something you don't understand. We know this isn't like a back and forth, but if we say like toodle pip, you're like, Tim, what's that mean? We can explain it. Please, please feel free to reach out and wave at us if we don't make any sense. Apparently Americans don't know what the word fussed means, so. <laughs> I'm not going to explain it. Um, um, we're really excited to be here. This is a great conference so far. This is our first time here. Uh, I just, I really have to thank the organizers for two reasons. One, this conference has been great. And the second reason is uh, by thanking the organizers. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> All right, let's get cracking then. So thank you for that, Tim. Very good. Uh, we, we need to fill you in on some things about us, not because we're egomaniacs. Well, we are egomaniacs, but that's not really relevant here. Uh, we need to tell you about us because it's relevant to the way we approach this topic. So there's a couple of things you need to know about us. First of all, we're both academics. Uh, I have a PhD in computer science, and Tim finished his this year and hasn't graduated yet. So he's basically a doctor as well. Uh, uh, not only are we academics, we're also game developers, as you can tell from my creepy outfit there. Uh, all game developers look like that, obviously. Um, so not only that, but we make games. We're also technical authors. We write lots and lots of books. We'll, we'll get back to that later. It's highly relevant for reasons. Uh, so we're academics, we're game developers, we're technical authors. And alongside all that, we're also programming teachers. We do a lot of training workshops. Uh, we honestly like teaching people things. That's why we also go to so many conferences. Also egomaniacs. That's probably relevant. Egomaniacs. Um, most importantly here, we think a lot about documentation. We write a lot of books. Uh, that's a lot of books. A really huge amount, a ridiculous amount of books. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, going back to like what we said, we've, we've sort of noticed there's this situation. We do a lot of programming training, a lot of workshops, a lot of talking to people and going, hey, what's going on? Uh, and in particular, we teach a lot of rapidly changing technology, uh, mostly because we really like the iPhone environment uh, and we're game developers, but those update pretty much at a six month pace. Something new is coming out, you have to worry about it. Uh, and We've started noticing that there's this thing that's happening when we do that, and the thing is we want better linkings between our code that we're talking to people and the documentation that exists. Stuff changes too fast, really, and it's really hard to keep up with it unless there's a better link between the code that we're trying to teach and the documentation and teaching material we're creating around that code. So in the last two or three years of teaching these classes, we've been teaching for much longer than that, but in the last two or three years we've been teaching a language called Swift, which is Apple's new language, and we'll, we'll tell you about that in a moment. Uh, and we've noticed people in the class particularly enjoying one feature of Swift, which is Apple's Swift Playgrounds, which are a live coding environment, as you might have guessed by now. Uh, um, so what, what we've noticed is that in general, before we started using Playgrounds more, is that people, uh, they got lost. Uh, we couldn't find a Gaston picture for lost, sorry. Um, but he's just too awesome. Uh, so people will get messed up. We will say something, they'll be writing the code or they'll be looking at the documentation and they will just get lost between what we're saying, what they're trying to do and what they're reading at once. They just get stuffed up and they can't pick back up. They're sitting in our classes, they're working in an IDE or a text editor, they're looking at notes that they're handwriting themselves, they're looking at our printed notes and they're looking at the documentation that comes with the, the environment they're working with and they're trying to correlate a piece of information between all these things and it's actually quite hard. Uh. Um, so what we've started using is these things called uh, interactive documentation environments, which is a word we've made up because we get to make up words, we're academics. Uh, 
That wasn't meant to be a joke. Um, <laughs> uh, but basically, um, it lets you take uh, comment riddled code, such as this sort of stuff, uh, which is very hard to learn from, and instead make it something a little bit more. So you get something that's more attractive that actually has formatting and something that looks like documentation sitting alongside the real life code, sitting alongside the thing that's actually being run. So you can play with it all in one setting and also maybe add your own notes to it. And we'll touch on that later. Uh, so it, it sort of leads back to this idea that we, we sort of will keep harping on constantly is the idea of the code, the person's own notes, and the official documentation all in one sort of thing. Uh, so by putting the code alongside the documentation, alongside an interactive output of the code, and people putting their own notes alongside the documentation and the code and the output, you sort of get something a bit more. It's, it's actually really quite useful. So it's, it's code plus docs plus notes. Um, so we, we started exploring this a little bit more, and then we saw that right, the docs had a call for papers. Uh, so we're like, hey, we'll, we'll put in for that. We know what we're doing, right? Sure. Um, and <laughs> so today we're calling them interactive documentation environments. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about them now. So there's a whole bunch of these things. We are primarily from the Swift world, so we talk about Swift a lot. That's primarily what we're going to be looking at today. We also have another one we'll show you later, which is based on the successor to IPython notebooks, which is called Jupyter Notebooks. Please stop naming your projects misspelled real words. Thank you. <laughs> um, no wow, apologies to anyone who's actually that's worked record, on Jupyter. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's a bunch of others. Perl has one. Ruby has a similar thing. There's, there's heaps of them. Uh, Jupyter Notebook supports a whole bunch of languages, uh, including Python, Haskell, maybe Scala uh, or something. Uh, uh, yep. It's, there's a lot of things. Um, the core features of these things are pretty simple. Um, so the basic idea is pretty much the same. You've got live code, so you actually get to see the code in real time, seeing what it's doing. You've got pretty formatting. Admittedly, it's mostly markup, which we've uh, marked down, which we've been told is bad. Um, you can add notes. You can add videos, GIFs. You know, if you really like GIFs, some people do. Uh, and it is actually real programming. It's real code that you're actually writing in there. It's not some sort of fake thing. You could actually change the code and get the real results immediately. They're pretty powerful, they're pretty cool. So before we go on and talk about these in a little more detail and show you some live demos, uh, we are not experts in any of this. We really just like this stuff and think it's useful. Uh, and we're true believers in getting information out there. Uh, we just want to share. We'd rather look like idiots and let you people learn something than not look like idiots and have people learn nothing. Uh, also, this sort of documentation isn't applicable to every possible documentation environment, obviously. So we're not trying to say you should do this for everything, even if we actually verbally do say that. We probably will say that. Um, OK, so quickly we'll talk about Swift. We haven't really got time to go through um, everything. So we're going to mostly focus on Jupyter and Swift. Um, and particularly we're going to talk about these things that we've mentioned called Swift Playgrounds. So Swift is Apple's new language. Hopefully many of you have heard of it. It's apparently meant to be huge, according to Apple. Uh, it is relatively new. It's been in development for many years, but Apple only told us about it two years ago. Uh, it's currently version 2.2. Version 3 is around the corner. This is the primary language people write iOS and Mac OS apps in uh, right now. And it was made open source in December, so we're very happy about that. It's made open source under the Apache license. We're also very happy about that. Uh, it currently supports OS 10 and Linux, and presumably people are working on a Windows port. Um, uh, we're pretty biased, but we think Swift is like the bee's knees and everyone should be using it. But again, we're biased, so take that with a lot of salt. A lot, yeah. So uh, playgrounds are a core part of Swift. Um, OK, so the weird thing about Playgrounds is they're not yet open source, annoyingly enough. Uh, the Swift REPL, which is the read, evaluate, print loop, which is what you get if you type Swift on a command line, is open source and is part of a Swift project and is the core part of what makes Playgrounds work. So theoretically, you could make Playgrounds work yourself, but right now, Playgrounds are not open source. Um, but Swift Playgrounds are essentially, you click, uh, an interactive Swift coding environment. So basically, you type some code, the result is immediately shown. Uh, evaluate and displayed. They're primarily for prototyping, experimentation, learning. Like Apple, they even call them playgrounds, not like learn grounds. They're mostly for mucking around, uh, is the general idea. Uh, they can be paginated, which I really like, so you can break things up into logical structures in a single file. Uh, and <laughs> they support Markdown and HTML. Uh, apparently, there's something against Markdown in this community. We swear we didn't know. Um, <laughs> Basically, playgrounds have all the features that we mentioned earlier as core features of an interactive documentation environment. If you want to play with playgrounds, you can grab Xcode from the App Store on a Mac, and we'll tell you what to do if you want to play with something else later on. So 
markup in playgrounds, basically what you'd expect. You can type a bunch of stuff and it renders it nicely alongside the code. We'll actually show you this in the demo very shortly. Um, these are still pretty new. Currently it supports basic HTML and markdown. Uh, they're very, very new though, so I wouldn't be surprised if in a little while you see uh, more support. Apple already uses Sphinx uh, for Swift, so I wouldn't be surprised if you start seeing some more integration with better tools. So IPython notebooks are the other interactive documentation environment that we mentioned. Uh, been around a long, long, long time. Uh, it's an interactive Python coding environment, otherwise the same as Swift pretty much. Um, yeah, it works the same. It's primarily built for academic and scientific documentation, uh, mostly math support, uh, so text, equations, graphs. Um, it's very rarely used for teaching, although that is starting to change now for various reasons. Um, it's, it's pretty, pretty it's, it's actually pretty solid. It's pretty solid. It's also pretty niche in terms of it's a scientific tool. It's designed so you can submit your working with a academic paper to show how you arrived upon something. It's not designed to document something. Or at least that's the exposure we've Originally. had to it. Uh, this is now starting to be replaced by Project Jupiter. Again, that weird name. Uh, I like the logo, though. Um, and it is the basically the successor to IPython. IPython is more or less now uh, the interactive Python bit inside of uh, Project Jupiter. Uh, it started 2014. It's very, very new. Um, it supports multiple languages, Haskell, Scala, R. It's capital R, not R. Um, and it's used by O'Reilly Media for a project whose pronunciation I'm never sure of, which is actually really cool. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So we're going to demo something in a minute called Oriol. We'll come back to that. We do a lot of books for O'Reilly Media. We have nothing to do with Oriol and are not promoting it for them. We just like it. Uh, so With that, it's time to be a little bit gutsy. Um, that's not a demo god. That's Paul Fenwick. Really nice guy, though. Um, <laughs> he might be a demo god. He might be, entirely yeah. Sure. Uh, we do actually have videos of our demos just in case they break, because, hey, we're not that stupid. Um, <laughs> but it wouldn't be as much fun, so let's get cracking. So the first thing we're going to demo is Swift Playgrounds, just very quickly. Uh, let's do that. I'm going to turn off mirroring. I'll turn on mirroring. Okay, here we go. So... Will this work? Let's do this. Yeah. All right. Mirror this. <gasps> oh, it worked. It worked. Okay. Well, that's no fun. <laughs> okay. So this is a, a playground, which teaches you how to put birds on things in Swift. It's very basic. Uh, it defines a Swift variable for the world. Swift supports emoji, by the way. So I decided to make the entire demo in emoji. Uh, don't actually do this for real programming. <laughs> Please. Um, so as you can see here, I've created the world, and I've put some things in the world, and then I've created some temporary working space to put things <laughs> in for the world. Wow, they really like the emoji. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Um, then I step through everything in the world, and I add a bird to it. Look, that's, that's distracting. Okay, there we go. I add a bird to everything in the world, and display the world with the birds added, as you can see over here. Uh, as you can see, this is a really quite a pretty little environment. We've got live code here, so if I add other things to the world, like things, that will just work. The, pro the playground is recompiling. Now we have things in the world, and now everything has got birds on it, <laughs> because that's how this works. Uh, here's a nice tip. As you can see, it's nicely formatted. Never use emoji in your code, as said by Plato, uh, apparently. But as you can see, it's nicely formatted. It's not something I can edit. It's just there sitting in the middle of my documentation. And we've got a link down the bottom here, which actually says next. So I can click that and move to the next uh, page in my playground and look at this. So I've got a pie here, and I'm going to quarter the pie. Uh, for no reason, I've inserted a GIF just to show it can be done. If you want to fill your documentation with GIFs, this is the place for you. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Uh, <laughs> Please. <laughs> Again, this is a demonstration of the features of a playground, not what you should be using playgrounds <laughs> for or how you should be programming Swift. We promise. Uh, here's another little class, uh, chicken. And we cook the chicken, apparently. But as you can see, terrible chicken. If I change that, it'll uh, recompile and it'll update appropriately. It's all happening live. Here's another example callout just to show you can do documentation callouts. Don't actually do this. Uh, if there was an egg emoji, I would use this. I initially put the guest on GIF in because I thought there was an egg emoji. I was mistaken. Uh, here's an experiment. Try not using an emoji, emoji in your code by definitely not putting emoji in your code. That's a bad idea. And here's some links. So if you want to read more, you can read the same thing three times. Also, our books are pretty great. Uh, let's go back to the first document we were looking at here, which is page one. I'm switching between the two pages up here. They're just files. And if I turn off the, uh, the rendering, I can go show raw markup, and you'll see what's actually happening here, which should be 
pretty much as you expect, but basically we've got something that resembles Markdown interspersed with our actual code. And because the Markdown's wrapped in comment tags, Swift just ignores it and renders it instead. It's actually fairly useful. And this callout emoji is everywhere. It turns, out into that, it turns into that nice looking callout we were seeing before, which is that. And so on and so on with all the other different features. And links work exactly how you'd expect. So next is just a link. Pretty straightforward stuff, but it's really powerful when it comes to actually putting documentation alongside code because the code is running all the time and you're seeing the output on the side over here. We'll take a look at a bit more of an advanced example in a moment. That's basically our Swift Playgrounds documentation features, though. So I'm going to turn mirroring off now. Oh, we can just leave it on. Should we leave it yeah. on? Okay. We'll, just, we'll just leave it on. Okay. Well, imagine we have some more slides with more live demo pictures. Um, so because mirroring didn't break, uh, we, we don't have to switch back and forth. So I'm just going to close this one here, and I'm going to open up one that Apple made, which is more of an example of using it properly in documentation. It's much nicer than what I could have done, because I'm an incompetent writer and Apple isn't. Uh, I'm not incompetent. That's terrible. Don't say that. Uh, so this is talking about physics, and we're not going to really talk about UI kit dynamics, because you don't really care about There's that. There's no emoji here. There's no emoji here for a start. Uh, it's got lovely, nice sort of syntax. But the real cool thing is this is a live coding environment. You can actually do real things. So this is actually working, he says. If he clicks uh, it. He has to start the playground. And I can actually just like boop, boop. Uh, and normally it runs at a frame rate that isn't some sort of important insult to your eyes uh, when it's not plugged into a projector. It's just a side effect of playgrounds being a little buggy. Um, so I'm just going to stop that. And again, this is a live playground environment, so we can actually sort of like change this as well. So I'm just going to copy that color, and I'm going to add in a couple more balls to Newton's cradle. Uh, but green is an ugly color, so let's like change some of these. I think we'll go blue, uh, and we'll go uh, whatever that color is. And people like purple, right? Purple's good. Yeah, purple's good. Cool, we'll go with that. Uh, and you know, I can run this again, and it'll It'll keep working, you know, except now it's even slightly more laggier. Uh, so it's getting more and more laggy all the time. The great thing is this is designed for teaching uh, in this situation. So we're actually talking, it's even going, hey, try changing the size and spacing of the balls. What happens if you make it negative padding instead of positive? That's boring. Let's look at behavior, because behavior is where you can actually really mess stuff up. What happens if we change the elasticity to, say, five times normal physics? What's that going to do? Whoop. <laughs> Well, there you go. We learned something. You can't, you know, increase physics five times and, and do whatever you want. It actually has some pretty negative side effects to how things work out. So remember how Funny we said this, this sort of environment wasn't for everything? What you've got here is a very tightly integrated package between Apple's APIs and the Swift language because it's made by Apple. And this thing on the side can display pretty much any UI element that you could make in an iPhone app or an OS X app, and you can use it there. That's really cool in the context of Apple, but it obviously doesn't work everywhere. But in the context of Apple, if you're trying to teach iOS programming or OS X programming, then there's nothing better than an environment like this where you can have try this and then see what happens directly. It's really, really powerful. OK, so I think that's probably enough looking at Newton's Cradle uh, and Swift. Let's take a little look at here. Uh, OK, this one's a little bit more crashy than Swift, and Swift is pretty crashy. Um, but this is still really, really cool. Um, and this is probably closer to what I think this sort of stuff will start becoming in the future. It's not quite ready yet. I'm just going to put it out there. We, this has nothing to do with us or what we do for O'Reilly. We just really like it. Because um, we do a lot of work for O'Reilly, it would not be fair for me to show things we work on. Yeah. Uh, so this is Regex Golf, uh, and it's trying to teach uh, Regex uh, through using, this is actually using Project Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and it's even got a live video embedded. I'm not going to play it because it's conference Wi-Fi. So the idea um, of this is the, the Peter Norvig, who is the guy in the video, he says things, and the pages scroll to the right point, and then you can play with them. Um, so again, you've got this lovely sort of like breakdown. You've got rich media in here, and he's actually explaining the XKCD that he's challenging here because he thinks he's found a mistake in the XKCD. Uh, I'm sure everyone here knows what XKCD is, right? Yeah. yeah OK, good. Yeah. This, hey, you didn't put your hand up. All right. <laughs> Go read XKCD. Um, so anyway, you know, we've got this, this regex, and he goes through it sort of explaining here. So he's got start, you know, we'll start with a list of presidents. Here's a list of presidents. I assume that's correct. I don't know. I'm from Australia. Uh, but <laughs> we'll run that script. I disconnected from server. Let's try and reconnect. Ah, refresh let's the refresh page. the page. It'll work, because demos always work. So right? our entire knowledge of US presidents and that sort of thing comes from Hamilton. So uh. really much about anything. Okay, so it worked okay. That time. So, you know, first thing we're doing is we're just spitting out 
the combination of winners and losers. There's some overlap here. So first thing we do is we cull it so losers has no winners in it. Everything's going so far. Now this is where we're actually getting to the meat. And we can actually see we've got some nice documentation. If we're playing the video, it will be live skipping to the correct moment, which is really, really cool. Um, don't try this on your hotel Wi-Fi because <laughs> it just it doesn't work. Um, but if you've got a solid connection, it's really, really great. Um, and this is where we actually start getting into something here. So we can go run and, you know, it'll work. And then let's actually print out this, uh, see if it works. And there we go. We get an error. We go, should not have matched Fremont. And if we go through, we can see, hey, he actually goes, hey, we should not have matched Fremont, and so on and so forth. The thing I really like about this is not only is he explaining what's going on, it's live, so we can just update it. So I have no idea who Fremont is. Again, remember, Australian. So let's just change history. Let's just remove Fremont from the list of losers. Where is he there? By Fremont. I assume it's a he. I'm, I'm even just assuming. I don't know. Oops. And now the other nice thing is we can add new presidents in, for example. So let's just <laughs> add someone else in. And at, sadly, we actually have to run all of these again because, you know, this stuff is still very work in progress -y. But now, if we run this, does uh, the Randall Munro's one work? No, it doesn't. It's still wrong. It should have found Trump because Trump is clearly going to be the next president. I've seen your ads. He's everywhere. I actually don't care. Um, <laughs> it's not me. Um, but anyway, so that's enough with this. And as you can see, it's actually really, really cool. You can play around with this stuff live. You can make people go, boo, when you add Trump in uh, to lists of things. And who doesn't like being booed about Trump? Um, but yeah, so this is uh, using Project Jupiter. So now we're just going to actually turn mirroring back off, hopefully. Tick box. Uh, tick box. And we'll get back to our slides. Can I go to the right, Tim? I'll uh, okay. Does this work? It's going to work. It's going to work. Right, cool. Wow, that worked. That worked. Gaston! Okay, so that's a really quick summary of what you can do with two different live documentation environments, Swift Playgrounds and Jupyter Notebooks. Is there actually a point to all of this? I'm sure you're wondering. Uh, so we're going to take you through a quick list of what we think are the strengths of something like this. Um, so the first strength is that you actually have the code and documentation literally together. I hope this is very, very obvious. Um, it's not just examples of the code, it is code. Uh, and you also have notes by the person reading the documentation together because, as studies have shown, when you actually write your own notes, you help remember boss. You've got the code, the documentation, and the notes in one. You can change things on the fly. You can add Trump in, you can remove Fremont. Uh, it's really, really useful stuff. You can also put pictures of Gaston in that animate. Uh, now, this is what we think are the strengths, but this stuff is quite new in the way people are using it, so we're really only guessing here. This, like, there might be new features that pop up that blow everyone's minds clean open, but this is what we think the strengths are at the moment. And in particular, we find the, uh, the mixing of notes, the live code, and the documentation is probably one of the bigger ones that we didn't even expect. We probably should have, because his PhD was actually in how people read information on computers. So sure, let's go with that. More or less. Um, it was a really big surprise to us how useful it was to people to be able to put their own notes, the things that they came up with as prompts to themselves or things that they needed clarification on, alongside the pre-written documentation that we were providing them, as well as the code that they were working with. Uh, it totally blew our mind. We were not expecting this at all. Uh, this is a quote from a participant in a training course for iOS development that we ran about a month ago in Melbourne. We aggressively asked for feedback, and it apparently works. Uh, this guy said, I find the documentation in my own notes living alongside it to be incredibly useful. Uh, it, other participants elaborated that they basically felt the, the fact they didn't have to keep jumping contexts between multiple things uh, and were able to stick in one place was just mind-blowing in their ability to get this done and learn faster. So we really think that's a a huge positive for this sort of approach in the future. It's, uh, it's obviously not all perfect, however. Um, there are some weaknesses. Uh, in particular, currently they only really support a subset of Markdown and a subset of HTML, uh, and it's also, again, like all the other Markdowns, it's their own subset of Markdown. Um, they're also kind of crashy, <laughs> as you saw with um, the ORM Oriel. It worked okay, but the first time I had to restart it, um, there's very limited language and framework support. Um, in, in particular, there's no real easy way of adding your own programming languages or your own APIs into these things unless you're already a technical person. If you're a proper technical person, you can do it, but I'm assuming mo well, most of the world is not technical people, so they're going to need other people to do this for it, and that needs to be made easier. And it doesn't hook into documentation tools. So if you've already got existing documentation, again, you're going to have to write some sort of like crude 
interface into these other tools to get or them working. Or make like a semi-broken website, like the really cool but very much the future of documentation and it's burning in flames, O'Reilly, Oriole thing. Yeah. Uh, it also only really works for narrative content where you're going step from step from step to step. Uh, we're not sure how this would work for, say, API documentation or something that wasn't necessarily a flow. That's not really a technical thing. It's just kind of currently all the examples really of people using this is narrative. So uh, starting with a concept and introducing changes over time. Apple's own documentation for Swift encourages people who are writing Swift libraries to use features like this to document their library. They're not really clear on how they expect you to actually do that, though. So Apple clearly is thinking about something there, but they haven't published all the documentation and related to it. I think O'Reilly's clearly thinking about it as well, because they've got that kind of cool website right. up and running. Uh, so what's actually the future? Well, um, I think the first thing is the clever boffins will fix the tech, so it works a little bit better, and it's easier to integrate things into it. Um, again, at the moment, you actually have to really know what you're doing to get this stuff up and running. Um, it will replace books and articles. Like, I honestly believe that. Um, and I think every publisher alive was also sort of realizing this. They're all starting to look in this sort of stuff. So traditional books, like the things we make uh, as authors, will go away to be replaced by playgrounds or notebooks or something along those lines. Blogs and article posts will go away to be replaced by these sort of things. Um, there'll be better support for non-narrative documentation. Currently, as you saw, even with the Peter Norvig's regex golf one, I had to run each previous step above it to get the current one to work. Uh, that sort of stuff will go away, and the, the environment will be a lot more uh, dynamic in its actual This uh, is kind of the natural interface. evolution of those API guideline examples that people often have where they tell you to run a curl command to test an API. I think it's not only natural for you to have a button to click in the browser, and some people have tried that in the past, but. They've had to jerry-rig their own solution, whereas... Now, now this stuff is, like, it's this close to being ready. Right. So close. Uh, and finally, I think there'll be better integration with video and screen sharing um, sort of stuff, because although we didn't, we didn't dare show it on the Wi-Fi, with the video where it can jump through the YouTube video with uh, having Peter explicitly explain what's happening is really, really nice alongside the code and the text. It's just really, really nice to have that there. So that's pretty much all we've got to say. Uh, we've got a few tips on where to learn more. If you've got a Mac, you can download Xcode from the Mac App Store and play with Playgrounds there. You do not need to know Swift or know anything about Xcode to use Playgrounds. It's just the first button you see when you fire up Playgrounds, and it's the easiest way to install it. If you're not on a Mac, probably try Jupyter Notebooks. The process is a bit complex, and the documentations are bad for Jupyter Notebooks. We apologize if someone here wrote them. Uh, or we're just stupid. I'm, I'm willing stupid. to rule that out. also um, very possible. Or you can go to try.jupyter.org, um, and they have an in-browser one. It's not as... Uh, as polished as the O'Reilly one, because um, it's more proving the concept as opposed to trying to use it as such. Or you could wait six months for Swift to work really well on Linux and, yeah, and Windows. that will probably also happen. That's happening. Uh, if you want to try the O'Reilly thing, then you can check out Regex Golf there, uh, and you can check out O'Reilly's thoughts on this thing in general. This is a lot of marketing words, but there's some good stuff buried in there. The Regex Golf one's probably the best one. Right. Uh, so that's everything. Thank you for listening to us. Uh, I don't know why Tim's always in the mask in these photos. <laughs> that is Tim, though. Yeah, it's me. Uh, you can find us on the ground up there after this, or on Twitter. Well, not actually on the ground. We'll be standing down there. We'll be standing. Well, um, I'm not going to be on the ground. And we'll put the slides and a bunch of notes up on our various blogs after this. So uh, thank you very much. That we finished with two minutes.